Well, I, I do want to just thank Pastor Brian again for allowing me to come and, and speak tonight and, um, and just bring a word to you because as I was um, doing Bible study last week, uh, well, toward the end of last week, I guess it was, um, as I was reading one day, the Lord said, um, write, write a message on this. And I just wrote that down in my journal and I kept, kept studying and and then I think it was the next day that Pastor Brian messaged me and said, can you speak Wednesday night? And so I knew um, that was confirmation that I was supposed to write that message. And, um, and then Heath and I had uh, some conversations at, at the house this past week. And, and it just kind of brought this message back up in, in my spirit. And so I, it is one that's a challenging word. I'll just go ahead and tell you that it's been a challenging word for me. Um, it's one that I have prayed through and, and one that I have asked the Lord to search my heart and to um, just reveal to me um, things that I have, you know, let go or fallen asleep um, about. And so the title tonight is Stay Awake. And um, I know Stephanie just got back from Ecuador. She stayed an extra week after us, so she's tired too. But, and I know it's Wednesday night, but hey, we can stay awake uh, just for a few more minutes. But God has given me a word tonight from Matthew 24, and it's verses 36 through 44. Matthew 24, verse 36 through 44. But concerning that day and hour, no one knows, not even the angels of heaven, nor the Son, but the Father only. For as were in the days of Noah, so there will be the coming of the Son of Man. For as in those days before the flood they were eating and drinking, marrying and giving in marriage, until the day when Noah entered the ark. And they were unaware until the flood came and swept them all away. So will be the, the coming of the Son of Man. Then two men will be in the field, one will be taken and one left. Two women will be grinding at the mill, one will be taken and one left. Therefore... Stay awake. Everyone say, stay awake. For you do not know on what day your Lord is coming. But know this, that if the master of the house had known in what part of the night the thief was coming, he would have stayed awake and would not have let his house be broken into. Therefore, you also must be ready, for the Son of Man is coming at an hour that you do not expect. So stay awake. Um, have you ever known that you had to stay awake like all night long? Oh, okay, I'm, I'm almost 50, so those nights, are, they, were, they were long gone for me. But when we used to help with the youth at a church in Dothan, and um, we ha helped, helped with the lock-in. And I can remember they were just, you know, they were raring to go. And, and I was doing okay, and then it got to be midnight, and then it got to be about 1 o'clock in the morning. And I was like, I just, I don't know that I'm going to make this. And I knew that if I ever sat down and got still, I would be asleep, whether it was sitting up straight in a chair or wherever I was. Um, but I knew that I had to stay awake. And that's, it's, it's very difficult sometimes when you're extremely tired. When we went to Ecuador um, a few weeks ago on the flight on the way home, we got on the plane at 1130 and we flew until 5, 10, 15, something the next morning. Yeah. Um, and so we... We tried to stay awake because um, on a plane you're not very comfortable. But anyway, staying awake, um, that is what God has called us to do. And so that's what I want to talk to you about tonight. In Matthew chapter 24, Jesus is talking about his return. We know that, that he's coming at an unknown time. And we know that he's talking about the rapture of the church. He's coming to take his followers to heaven. In verse 37 through 39, it tells us that in the, as in the days of Noah... Just before the flood, the people were just going about their daily lives. They were doing normal things. It says they were unaware until the flood came and swept them all away. So will be the coming of the Son of Man. And then verse 41 told us, you know, that two men would be in a field. One would be taken and one would be left. Two women grinding at the mill, one taken and one left. So today we could say, hey, there'll be, t there'll be people at work and, and one will be taken and one will be left. Or we could say there'll be people on vacation. Some will be taken and some will be left. Or there'll be people at Walmart. Some will be taken and some will be left. Some will be left behind. We see here, though, that the point that Jesus is making is that life is going to be happening. It's just going to be happening when he returns in, in the air to take his faithful followers home with him. And it will be unexpected. If you've ever seen the movie Left Behind, I know it's an older movie, but it portrays 
the day of the rapture and people were on an airplane and all of a sudden half the people on the airplane are gone and their clothes are just sitting in their seats and people were driving down the interstate and all of a sudden there's crashes everywhere because the drivers of a lot of the cars were gone they had been raptured um really chaos is what is what ensues but it, it shows um really what's going to happen on the de- on that day because we're just going to be going about our business we're going to be going about e- our daily life If we jump to verse 43 of Matthew 24, it tells us, But know this, if the master of the house had known in what part of the night that the thief was coming, he would have stayed awake and would not have let his house be broken into. Now, unfortunately, and some of you in here may can relate, Heath and I can really relate to this, um, the thief coming. Um, It wasn't in the night, it was in the daytime, but several years ago, we, um, I had a, a speaking engagement right after school and so I had asked a friend to um, take Meredith and Madison home and drop them off because I knew they wouldn't be there long by themselves and they got home and our back door had been kicked in and um, they didn't really know what it was going on so Meredith calls Heath and says you know have you been working on the back door and he realizing what had happened he said run run into the woods take your phone call 911 nan just lives right down the road so nan comes flying down the road you know to to find the girls and um thankfully they were not the robber was not in the house but they had been all through our house and they had uh, you know gone through things and they had stolen things and it's an eerie feeling to know that somebody has been in your house and has taken your things um but when I, I can tell you that when we left that morning, we had no idea that that was going to happen that day. Because I promise you, we were just going about our business. We had plans that day. We had to-do lists. We had work. We were just going about our business. But I can assure you that if Heath Watley had known somebody was coming to our house that day, he would not have been at work. He would have, they would have never even made it in our driveway. But we didn't know. We were just going about our business and going about our daily lives. And just as we had no idea that those events would take place that day, the word tells us that Jesus is coming back for his faithful followers one day, and it will take place when we least expect it. In verse 42, the key verse is the key verse for us tonight. Therefore, stay awake, for you do not know on what day your Lord is coming. And the words stay awake, they are present present imperative tense meaning that it's for this time and it's for this moment and it's imperative which means it's a command one commentary even says stay awake is a continuous action for this present time we must always be prepared right now for his coming right now ready for the lord's return at any time we must be living as if he could come back today because truly he could we must stay awake now, I know it's Wednesday night, like I said, and I know we're tired, and you've been through work most of the, half of the week, and um, we're, we're fighting sleep right now, but I encourage you just to stay awake a little bit longer tonight, because in our daily walk with the Lord, we must stay awake. The Lord isn't telling us, obviously, to physically stay awake. Thank goodness we can lie down and, and, and sleep, because in Proverbs three twenty four it says, if you lie down, you will not be afraid. When you lie down, your sleep will be sweet. So we know he's not telling us not to sleep physically, but he is telling us to be aware, to be prepared, and to be about his business as we go throughout our lives every day. So if we look at Matthew 25, verses 1 through 13, we see another parable. And this one also encourages us to be prepared and to be awake. The parable of the ten virgins, Matthew 25, 1 through 13. Then the kingdom of heaven will be like ten virgins who took their lamps and went to meet the bridegroom. Five of them were foolish and five were wise. For when the foolish took their lamps, they took no oil with them, but the wise took flask of oil with their lamps. As the bridegroom was delayed, they all became drowsy and slept. But at midnight there was a cry, Here's the bridegroom, come out to meet him. Then all those virgins rose and trimmed their lamps. And the foolish said to the wise, Give us some of your oil, for our lamps are going out. But the wise answered, saying, Since there will not be enough for us and for you, go rather to the dealers and buy for yourselves. And while they were going to buy, the bridegroom came. And those who were ready went in with him to the marriage feast, and the door was shut. Afterward, the other virgins came also, saying, Lord, Lord, open to us. But he answered, Truly I say to you, I do not know you. Watch therefore, for you know neither the day nor the hour. 
And I don't know about you, but it makes my heart sink to hear that the door is shut and to hear um, to hear him say, I, I did not know you. Truly, I do not know you. These five foolish virgins knew that the bridegroom was coming. They had been right there with the five that were wise. And notice verse 6 says, the bridegroom has come. And then verse 7 says, all the virgins arose and trimmed their lamps. All of them, they all got up. The five foolish ones knew in their mind that the bridegroom was coming one day. They were even hanging out with the five wise ones. But notice that just hanging out with the wise, with the ones that were prepared for his return, it didn't mean that the foolish ones were prepared. And honestly, I know this is a Wednesday night crowd, but we've got to get serious for living, about living for the Lord. And it's time to become awake. It's time to be spiritually awake. And it's time for us to recognize that just knowing about him is not enough. It's time for us to realize that coming to church doesn't prepare us for eternity. It's all about our relationship with him. And this is what I've been mulling over in my spirit for the last week or about the last half of the week. And, and just praying through and asking the Lord to stir things in my heart. Because I, I assure you, I'm including myself in this message. I'm not sharing anything with you that the Lord has not already dealt with me about. In Matthew 25, verse 8, something struck me when I read it that had never jumped out at me before. And the foolish said to the wise, Give us some of your oil, for our lamps are going out. Give us some of your oil. When we stand before the Father one day, we're not going to be able to look to our right or to our left. And we're not going to be able to say, give me some of your oil or give me some of your relationship with Jesus. It's just going to be me and Jesus standing there. It's just going to be you and Jesus standing there or our children and Jesus standing there or our grandchildren and Jesus standing there. And I know each one of us here tonight, all we want to hear is well done, good and faithful servant. And we've got to stay spiritually awake. So how do we do this? How do we stay spiritually awake? If we turn to Luke chapter 12, verse 35 through 40, we see similar verses as in Matthew. Verse 35, stay dressed for action and keep your lamps burning and be like men who are waiting for their master to come home from the wedding feast so that they may open the door to him at once when he comes and knocks. Blessed are those servants whom the master finds awake when he comes. Truly, I say to you, he will dress himself for service and have them recline at table, and he will come and serve them. If he comes in the second watch or the third and finds them awake, blessed are those servants. But know this, that if the master of the house had known at what hour the thief was coming, he would not have left his house to be broken into. You also must be ready, for the Son of Man is coming at an hour you do not expect." So we have to stay dressed for action. This is one way that we stay spiritually awake, is to stay dressed for action, spiritually dressed, living in his character traits, living out and serving his purposes. Pastor Brian's been teaching on the full armor of God on Wednesday nights. Putting on the full armor every day is one way that we stay dressed for action and that we stay spiritually awake. We know in Ephesians 6, it tells us about the full armor. You've got the belt of truth wrapped around your waist, knowing the truth, and it's a, a commitment to integrity. The breastplate of righteousness, godly character, being in a daily relationship with Jesus protects our heart. The shoes of peace, it's having put on the readiness to share the gospel and the, the gospel of peace. The readiness to boldly proclaim the gospel message. And then you have the shield of faith, which will extinguish all of Satan's flaming arrows. And the helmet of salvation that renews our mind daily in the word of God. And then the sword of the spirit, which is the word of God. And it is our offensive weapon in spiritual warfare. I just want to share you real quick, uh, with you real quick, a, um, a lesson that I learned from Pris Priscilla Shire. And it is about the, um, the shield of faith. She says that the shield of faith, when they had the, their shield in battle, their shield was about four feet tall, about two feet wide. It was made of planks of board put together. Those planks were wrapped in canvas. Then they were wrapped in leather. And then they had a metal shield in the middle and metal edging on, around the edges. She said that, of course, as they charged into battle, they would hold those shields in front of them. But when the enemy started sending arrows the darts and the fiery darts and the flaming arrows, they would back together 
in, into what she called the turtle formation. So just imagine a whole group of people and they're backing together and then they're taking their shields and instead of holding them in front of them, they're putting them over their head. So it creates a turtle shell o over the entire group. She said the fiery darts were really, the fire part was really not meant to, to kill, it was meant to distract. Because when the fiery darts came, if the men that were holding this, this section of the turtle shell, if their part got caught on fire, then they would be distracted because they're trying to put out the fire. And then that leaves a weak link for the enemy to come in. And that just, it blew me away when I heard that. And I've shared it several times since because that's what the enemy does to us. He sends fiery darts our way to distract us. It may not, he may not be trying to kill us with these certain darts, but he's trying to distract us and he's trying to, to get us off the path that God has for us. He's trying to lull us to sleep instead of having us spiritually awake. Satan's biggest fear, I read this the other day, is for you to become, is, is, I'm sorry, Satan's biggest fear is for you to become what God created you to be. He does not want us to become what God has created us to be. And this is why he's tried everything to make us lose focus. And he's tried everything to get us distracted. He, 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 he distracts us and he tries to make us try to keep up with people beside us or try to do what everybody else is doing or try to fall into what the world is doing. And this is, what I've, again, what I've been thinking about in my own life. Can I tell you that who you hang around with matters? Because don't you want your shield, when you back into that sh turtle shell formation, don't you want your shield completely over you, you and your group? I want to be hanging around with Christian friends that, that have got that shield of faith and they're ready to hold that over us and to, to um, create that shield above us whenever the enemy is attacking. So every day we can stand together and we can, we can put on the full armor of God. We can take our hands actually and just put on and just go through the pieces every morning and, and, and put those on and, and pray over each piece of the armor that day. So the first way to stay spiritually awake is to be spiritually dressed. The second way to stay spiritually awake is to spend time talking to our Heavenly Father we got to spend time in prayer. we got to spend time talking to him. 1 Thessalonians 5, 1 through 6, it was entitled, The Day of Our Lord. Now, brothers and sisters, about times and dates, we do not need to write you, for you know very well that the day of the Lord will come like a thief in the night. While people are saying peace and safety, destruction will come on them as labor pains on a pregnant woman, and they will not escape. But you, brothers and sisters, are not in darkness, so that this day should surprise you like a thief. You are all children of the light and children of the day. We do not belong to the night or to the darkness. So then let us not be like others who are asleep, but let us be awake and sober. And if you jump to verse 16, it says, Rejoice always, pray continually, give thanks in all circumstances, for this is God's will for you in Christ Jesus. So rejoice always and pray continually and give thanks. Praying continually, prayer, communication with God, it is an all-important component of being spiritually awake. We can't be completely spiritually awake if we're not having a, a conversation with Him daily, all throughout the day. We know praying doesn't necessarily mean we are knelt down with our eyes shut and uh, you know we're, we're all by ourselves. That certainly has a place, but praying continually means all during the day that we're praying, that we have the Lord on our mind during the day, that as we go into Walmart, we're listening to his voice, or as we're driving around in our car, sometimes we're, we choose to talk to him instead of turning on the radio or, or listening to a podcast. If we're cleaning house, we're intentionally listening to his voice or talking to him. Constant communication with the Lord we are, is the way that we're going to stay spiritually awake. If we position ourselves to have conversations with the Lord, then we're going to be about his business. And there's a key, too. We have to position ourselves. When I'm riding in the car, sometimes I don't choose to talk to him, and I don't choose to listen. Sometimes I choose to, to just listen to the radio or call somebody. And there's a time and place for that. But there's times that I know the Lord is saying, hey, just, just listen to me while you're driving. If we position ourselves to have conversations with him, then we're going to be about his business. We're going to let him direct our paths, and we're going to recognize that interruptions to our day just might be a divine appointment. I don't know how many divine appointments I've missed because I have not allowed him to interrupt my plan or my purpose or my check checklist for the day. If we're praying continually, we're going to recognize our Father's voice. 
John 10, 27 says, My sheep hear my voice, and I know them, and they follow me. We need to ask ourselves tonight, how familiar am I with the Lord's voice? Because you see, there are many voices that are vying for our attention. Many voices that want to tell us which way to go. Many voices that want to lead us astray. Not long ago, I was driving, and I was going to my brother's house in Valdosta, and um, I was just about to get into Dothan. And, of course, I know my way through Dothan, but I had already set the GPS for later on in the trip, so I didn't have to do that. And the GPS started telling me to take turns that I knew were wrong in Dothan. I grew up around Headland, in Headland, so I, I had been in Dothan all my life. But the GPS started telling me the wrong turns to take. Sometimes in life, we're taking wrong turns because we're listening to the wrong voices. And we need to be so familiar with God's voice that we recognize when it's not his voice telling us directions to take. And the more time we spend with him, the more time talking to him in prayer, the more familiar we're going to be with his voice. But we got to be intentional about it, just like positioning ourselves to spend time with him. we got to be intentional about building time in our day for conversations with him. It's easy to get distracted. Even when you make time and you sit down and you say, okay, I'm going to have time with the Lord. It's easy to get distracted. Those little phone things that we have, you know, they, they beep and they buzz and they, you know, I just have to turn it over sometimes and, and move it away from me. But we got to make time for him. You know, if, if Heath and I never talk to each other, if we just walk through the house, you know, every day and we never talk to each other, we never said anything to each other, we wouldn't know each other very well. And talking is what opens up the lines of communication. It allows us to share what's on our heart. It allows us to, to get to know each other. And the same goes for us and God. If we don't ever talk to him, we're not going to know what's on his heart. We're not going to know what, he, what his path is for us. We know that it's not just a religion, it's a relationship. And that's, where it, that's, that's the difference, and that's how we're going to know him is spending time with him. On Sunday, Pastor Brian mentioned prayer, and he said prayer isn't just us trying to talk God into doing what we want him to do, or it's not us trying to get God to do something that is outside of his will, but prayer is releasing God to do what is in his will to do in our lives. I once read that if I haven't prayed, that something has gone undone in someone's life or in my life. And that struck me, and I'll never forget that, because there are days that I have gone through and, and haven't prayed, or I've just been so busy, and I go here and there. And then at the end of the day, I think, have I prayed today? Did I pray for anybody else today? We need to know that prayer matters. Colossians 4.2 says, Continue steadfastly in prayer, being watchful in it with thanksgiving. And Ephesians 6.18, at the end of the full armor of God, it says, Praying at all times in the Spirit. I can tell you there is power in praying in the Spirit. And praying in your prayer language, there is nothing like it. And the power of God that comes from that in us, and, and then He can use it and he can, His power can flow through us. But those are, those are some of the most precious times that I've had with the Lord is just praying in my prayer language because we know then that you're praying the perfect will of the Father. So to stay spiritually awake, we must be spiritually dressed in the full armor of God. We must pray continually. And then the third step to staying awake is reading the Word of God. The Word of God is the sword of the Spirit. We can't pick up the sword of the Spirit if we don't, if we don't read His Word. Hebrews 4.12 says, For the Word of God is living and active, sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing to the division of soul and of spirit, of joints and of marrow, and discerning the, th the thoughts and intentions of the heart. The Word is alive and active. It doesn't sound, it, it doesn't sound like something that's going to make you go to sleep when you read it, if it's alive and active. And I, I know there's times that I have read the Bible and I've thought, what in the world have I just read? Or I really just don't understand, you know, what, what this means. But if we continue to seek Him, if we continue to ask Him, ask Him for a desire to read His Word. I have said many times that that is one prayer that God will answer. If you pray and you ask the Lord to give you a greater desire than you've ever had to read His Word, He's going to answer that, that prayer. Verse 12 also tells us that the Word of God discerns the thoughts and intentions of the heart. God will use His Word if we take the time to study, and He will search our hearts. He will use His Word to reveal, us the, to, reveal to us the intentions of our heart. It doesn't really happen in a five-second 
um, Priscilla Shower says, um, read a verse a day to keep the devil away. <laughs> um, it, it doesn't happen if we just do that and we say, check, I've read, I've read my verse for the day. It does take some time, and it takes time in, in studying his word and, and allowing God to teach us from his word. 2 Timothy 3, 16 through 17 says, All scripture is breathed out by God and profitable for teaching, reproof, for correction, and for training in righteousness, that the man of God may be complete, equipped for every good work. And we want to be equipped. We want to be prepared for the battle. We want to be spiritually awake. We want to be ready to live each day for him. This is one reason that I love our women's Bible studies. We do them three times a year, and uh, we just finished one um, just a few weeks back but we don't do these just to get together we do have fun now and we do have coffee and, and some um, things to eat every once in a while you know but it, that's not the reason that we do it we do it because we love the Lord and because we we want to know more of his word and we love studying it together and it's it's it is just it's amazing the different um, opinions, the different views that you can get from different ladies because we, we all talk and we all interact with each other. And so that's the reason that we, that we do those Bible studies three times a year so that we can get to know each other but get to know the Word of God more. This, I thought this was really interesting. The Center of Bible Engagement compiled some research findings in a document, and it's called Understanding the Bible Engagement Challenge, Scientific Evidence for the Power of Four. And in the study, they polled 40,000 people, and they were ages 8 to 80. They wanted to see how people were engaging in Scripture. And as they compiled the results, they made a profound discovery that they were not even looking for when they originally planned the survey. The study indicated that when people engaged in the Scripture one time a week, and that could just be even just the pastor saying, open your Bibles to, um, that there was negligible effect on some key areas of their life when they just read it one time a week. The same was true if they engaged in Scripture two, two times a week. The result equaled to little to no effect. Three times a week saw a small indication of life. There was a slight pulse, a faint heartbeat. Something moved in the behavior of the person engaging in Scripture. But the eye-opener came when the Bible engagement reached at least four times a week. A steady climb of impact would have been expected, but that was not the case. The level basically stagnant over days one and two, and then there was a small bump on day three, but then when day four was reached, the effects spiked in an astounding way. And these were the, the findings. Feeling lonely dropped 30%. Anger issues dropped 32%. Bitterness in relationships dropped 40%. Alcoholism dropped 57%. Sex outside of marriage drops 68%. Feeling spiritually stagnant drops 60%. Viewing pornography drops 61%. Sharing your faith jumped 200%. And discipling others jumped 230%. So these findings hammer home the truth that there are profound differences between people who engage in the scripture at least four times a week and those who engage... In the, with the scripture less often. So no wonder the enemy tries to keep us busy and he does not want us in, in the word and spending time in the word. We can't be spiritually awake without reading and studying the word. When I embarked on praying the prayer that I said a while ago, asking the Lord to, to give me a desire, a greater desire than I had ever had to read the word, that was probably about seven years ago. And um, he has continued to give me a greater desire um, to read his word and, and to understand it. So I, I challenge you tonight, if, if, if you sit down and, and like we all have, there have been times we have all sat down and said, I just, I don't understand it or I really just don't want to read this tonight. But I, I challenge you to pray that prayer and just ask the Lord to give you a greater desire to read his word and to understand it. That's what I ask him, to give me a sharper mind, to understand what I'm reading and to remember what I'm reading. But going back to our opening scripture, Matthew 24, 36 through 44, but concerning that day and hour, no one knows, not even the angels of heaven, nor the Son, but the Father only. For as were the days of Noah, so will be the coming of man. For as in those days before the flood, they were eating and drinking, marrying and giving in marriage until the day when Noah entered the ark. And they were unaware until the flood came and swept them all away. So will be the coming of the Son of Man." 
Then two will be in the field, one taken and one left. Two women will be grinding at the mill, one taken and one left. Therefore stay awake, for you do not know on what day your Lord is coming. But know this, that if the master of the house had known in what part of the night the thief was coming, he would have stayed awake and would not have let his house be broken into. Therefore you also must be ready, for the Son of Man is coming at an hour that you do not expect. So stay awake. We've got to get spiritually dressed every day with the full armor of God. We've got to spend time in prayer with our Lord on a continual basis and read and study the active living word of God. And then even as Matthew says, we don't know when he is returning, but we will be ready whenever he shows up. And we'll be walking in a right relationship with him. We'll know his voice and he will know us. And we'll be living for him daily. Does it mean we're going to be living in a, a perfect life? Absolutely not. But at least it means we're going to be striving to live for him and striving to, um, to walk in his character. So my question for us tonight, as, as Blake, you can come back if you don't mind. My question for us tonight, and this is the question, like I said, that I've been asking myself. Are you awake? Am I awake spiritually? Am I ready for the Lord to return today? Because we don't know when he's coming back. We know there's one thing for sure that we do know. We're closer today than we were yesterday to his return. There's no shame in this message tonight. It is not a message of condemnation, but a wake-up call. It, that's what it's been in my life, and I, I pray that it is in yours. We need to be ready, and if we are ready, if we know we're ready, we need to be praying over our families and our friends because the word clearly states that narrow is the way that leads to eternal life. We have a world full of people who know about Jesus, but they don't have a relationship with Jesus. So I pray that over this next few minutes that we can just uh, get quiet before the Lord right where you are and just ask the Lord to reveal places maybe in your life that you've fallen asleep or maybe friends or family that we know have fallen asleep. Maybe they know the Word of God. Maybe they, maybe they grew up in church. We're dealing with some of this in our family. They know the Word. They've been taught the word, but are they living it out? Are they walking it out? We want our friends and family to be ready. We want us to be ready because that day is coming. And it's going to be a wonderful day. It's going to be an exciting day. And the day that we can stand before him and hear, well done, good and faithful servant. I don't even know that I'll be able to stand. So let's just take a few moments right now, just right where we are. And just allow the Lord to move in your heart and in mine.